right, we've been tracking the rise of COVID cases over the last few weeks consistently on the show and a lot of our regular viewers uh, would be up to date with what has been happening. But today is an important development which deserves closer scrutiny. So the Ministry of Home Affairs issued a set of guidelines for states and union territories earlier this evening. Now, what are these guidelines? Uh, it's essentially nothing really new that hasn't been said before. It's largely a reiteration and a reminder of sorts to states and union territories and everyone really that COVID-19 norms need to be adhered to, that it's not over yet and let's not forget about it. But here's what is crucial and key. They have urged states and union territories to enforce social distancing norms more strictly, which would include imposing fines, etc. for those who are not wearing masks. Uh, public gatherings, um, uh, which uh, were limited up to 200, can be reduced to 100 by the individual states and union territories. They can impose night curfews if they need to, but are urged not to bring local lockdowns without consultations from the central government. And that's important um, because uh, that essentially shows that we're not heading into any wide scale lockdowns right now. They've also set a parameter for when we should have staggered offices and this is pretty crucial as well. The criteria is 10% of a weekly case positivity rate for a return to staggered timings in office and that's important because so far there hasn't been any clear number uh, for when some of these measures kick in. So what is the situation we are in? How scary is it really and honestly and that's really the question we all want to know, right? Are we heading to another bout of localized lockdowns? Why are we talking about containment zones again? To shed some light on that, I'm joined this evening by Dr. Giridhar Babu, who's the head of the Life Course Epidemiology at PHFI, uh, Anand Bhan, a global health and policy expert, also on the show. Welcome to the show to both of you and thank you for speaking with us. Uh, Dr. Babu, let me begin with your take. Are the numbers truly looking alarming? Um, is this um, just precautionary measures that are taking place? And as we've seen in the past, can we progressively expect stricter and more stringent measures to stop the spread of COVID-19? Are we losing the plot somewhere? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> thanks uh, for ha um, having on this show, uh, Tamina, and it's great to be with Anant again here. So uh, let, to put things in perspective, the virus is very much around. The vaccine, not definitely in the near future, the only thing we can continue is avoiding the three C's, which we generally say close contact settings, close space and crowds. But there seems to be some fatigue setting in uh, most people. And also uh, there is sort of, okay, how long can we do this? So that kind of an attitude setting in at the population level. So therefore, while the innovative measures in communications are absolutely necessary, the governments and administrations at every place are also finding it increasingly difficult to make sure that people follow, be comply with the guidelines that are ongoing. So the um, Home Ministry's guidelines issued today are very much in alignment with uh, most of these COVID appropriate behavior that has been stressed by Health Ministry for a very long time. But now they have come up with uh, even more uh, guidance in terms of uh, how containment can be done, how buffer zones can be done, what kind of uh, weekly activity can be allowed. So that's important. And although the driver's seat is still with the uh, health ministry, home ministry doing it will give even stricter, uh, uh, you know, sort of enforcement. But community participation people understanding that this is not over it, especially with the New Year celebrations around, with the vacation period again coming up. This is the time for all of us to understand that this battle is not over it. <clears throat> the numbers are concerning, especially in Delhi, and uh, the same might happen in other places. In your show earlier, I had said, this is like a hide and seek game. As long as there are pockets of uh, susceptible people getting exposed to the virus, over a period of time, there are bound to be peaks, multiple peaks throughout the country. So especially in areas where the testing has been poor earlier. So we need to watch out, <clears throat> but I will not say this is very concerning on a uh, on a country level. Each state will have its own zones. 
each area will have its zones. Therefore, while the total numbers might continue to decline, we will have problems uh, in localized areas, and that's where the focus should be. The manner. Uh, um, Anand, we spoke last week where I had asked you about what the situation looks like. Now, a few days later, are the numbers or the usual parameters that we track to see the spread of COVID, are they looking like they are in the wrong direction? And, you know, what is your sense of where we are heading? Um, are we going to see more and more local administrations maybe coming in with more stringent measures or will the night curfews manage it? I recall you saying that my night curfews doesn't really make sense. Yeah, thanks, Tamana. And, um, you know, as Giri was highlighting, there is certainly cause for caution. Uh, we know that uh, the only measures we have are uh, mask usage, physical distancing and hygiene measures. The vaccine is a bit of a distance away. And we also know there's been some spike in number of cases, at least in some parts of India. We are also uh, in the winter season. We are also having air pollution as a factor. The health system is getting stressed in some parts of India. So I think the health, uh, Home Ministry probably is uh, trying to be cautious about the fact that given that we are going to have a colder spell ahead, that it's better to be uh, more proactive about this. And I think in many ways, I would tend to think this is something which is positive. You know, you have uh, the center setting broad guidance and then leaving it to local uh, state level and district level authorities to make the final decision around where to focus down, you know, where to have these containment zones, what kind of uh, stricter measures to be putting uh, in, because I think that's really important. What we should worry about is some kind of a standard uh, size fits all uh, approach, uh, which we saw, for example, with the lockdown. And we know that there were issues with that. Uh, the other positive, I think, is at least there's five days notice this time. You know, uh, there there is going to be a set of measures which the state is, uh, states are supposed to implement. They have a few days now to plan for that and uh, work hopefully with local authorities in designing a plan for implementation. Having said that, you know, some components I'm still not sure about night curfews, etc. I mean, I think they are more, as I said earlier on your show, uh, to show that we are doing something, but, you know, if they really make any impact uh, is a question mark. So we really now need to see how uh, district level implementation happens. Um, again, you know, I am hopeful as Giri is that this doesn't become a law and order response because the Home Ministry is driving it. Uh, even at the local level, hopefully they will work with public health experts, with the health department, and ensure that uh, the response is actually driven by local health evidence and local data, and not by, uh, by police going outside and you know catching people and thinking that this is something like ordering, uh, like you know, uh, just like a curfew response, etc. I don't think that is an effective response. We need public health expertise to be driving the response, uh, but but certainly a positive step today by the centre. You know, absolutely. It's taking me back to those uh, first few awful weeks of lockdown when you had incidents, especially around Mumbai and Maharashtra, of uh, uh, the police getting sort of, uh, you know, very uh, easy to use with lattes, etc. for whoever was roaming around on the streets. Um, another thing that I want to get some clarity on uh, with you, Dr. Babu, is the reiteration of containment zones. Now, the containment zone identification and policy was already there. Uh, as far as I know, if there are two or more cases, it's a containment zone, uh, at least in Delhi in some areas. Now, maybe they're making it three cases or more. But it had become kind of lax. Uh, where local authorities were not really demarking areas too aggressively. Do you think that this measure is sort of a throwback to ensure that wherever the cluster of cases are, it's arrested soon enough? This is more of a wake-up call to local authorities? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Tamanna, and I think we need to uh, definitely uh, keep track how the virus is moving. So, why in the earlier phase of the uh, outbreak and then local transmission and then widespread uh, clusters and then community transmission, each stage required its own response. Currently, while there is receding outbreaks in the major metros, again, some of the pockets where, as I said, susceptible population are higher in number, there the cases are emerging. And that area would definitely require containment. And when we say containment, it has to be tailor-made to that particular ward, particular zone, in such a manner that there is no widespread transmission going on. 
And with these containment measures, what we are enforcing is the vulnerable are protected. So, as you said, because of the laxity in enforcing containment measures, there is widespread, uh, you know, uh, outbreak if you are not able to contain in the early stages. And that's why uh, the stress on containment is important, especially if the area is getting the, uh, you know, cases for the first time or there is re-emergence in an area where it is already reducing. So, from that perspective, driving this message loud and clear that containment measures should not be relaxed, they should be given the most importance. I think that's that's a positive thing to do uh, in the overall scenario. Anand, if I may ask what the impact is going to be for the Aam Janta, because you know that's what people want to understand at the end of the day. Uh, can they continue to undertake the activities that they were, which were slightly more than uh, the severe lockdown and essentials? Uh, people have been going out to socialize a bit, uh, they have been going to malls, to parks, to markets, etc. Is that all likely to continue? It looks likely that will continue. There's not been any major change in the requirements for uh, malls to function, for public markets, etc. It's just, I think, a reiteration in the guidelines that uh, care, due care needs to be taken for physical distancing and that people, you know, masks uh, need to be enforced, etc. And it is left to the local authorities to do it. Now, part of the problem, I think, is that we know that there's been laxity. Uh, you know, all of these similar guidelines have existed in the past, at least for uh, requiring us to use these public health measures, but it's not happened. So, you know, we have to also figure out, as Giri was rightly pointing out, measures which can help us uh, get more adherence, and that requires working with the communities, because that is not going to happen by publishing gazette notifications or notices or guidelines. That's actually going to happen when you work with local communities, and I think the success we've seen across the country has been largely in those pockets where this has been owned by local community groups, uh, by uh, local leadership, etc. So I think that's the lessons we need to draw and, and ensure. So the second part around containment zones, I totally agree with Giri. My only concern, honestly, is that uh, at the end of the day, this requires us to have boots on the ground. You know, you need contact tracers to go in and do contact tracing. We haven't seen a strategy yet of enhancing our human resources to enable that. What they are often doing is taking away health workers uh, who are, uh, you know, part of our, our vaccination workforce, our ASHA workers, uh, our urban ashas, you know, our ANMs, etc., and getting them to do this COVID duty, which means that our non-COVID uh, healthcare is certainly getting impacted. I mean, it's now been quite a few months that we've seen a dip in non-COVID care. And, um, you know, one thing I worry about, and I'm sure Giri would agree, is that we need to ensure that our non-COVID healthcare also does not unduly suffer. And hence, human resources are required for activities like this. The health system needs to invest in them. You cannot escape that. You know, there is no magical uh, technology which can replace someone going door to door and trying to find out who you might have potentially come in contact with. No, let, let's be honest, we should have had that force ready by now. There has been enough time and enough months of having to grapple with this. And uh, we will have to admit that this is a lapse in part of um, the general public as well as administration uh, we did let loose a little around the festive season and perhaps we're paying the price for it but on that note i want to thank uh, both uh, anand bhan and of course uh, dr giridhar babu for joining us on the first leg of this discussion